Well, good morning. Can you hear me? Thanks, Dave. Well, good morning and welcome here, church. Let's open in prayer. Loving, gracious, heavenly Father, we do come into your presence this morning by the blood of Christ. We thank you again for the work of Jesus on the cross. We thank you that we can come into your presence, bathed in his righteousness, justified in your sight by his work. And now we rejoice that we have the hope of the resurrection because Jesus lives now at your right hand. Father, we pray this morning that you'd be with us, that your spirit would move freely amongst us, to even those who are walking around, who are listening in, who might be curious. Father, we pray that today would be the salvation for all those who do not know you as their own personal Savior. Lord, we would just pray again this morning that you'd be with us and that you would comfort the brokenhearted, those who are in need. We are a needful people and we desperately need you, God. We praise you and thank you that you're our Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine outside and that we can meet in this way. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So very quickly, our announcements this morning. It's wonderful to have you all here. It's a very bright, sunny day. I think this is the first Sunday that they have not forecasted rain, and yet, in spite of the last few weeks of forecasted rain, we haven't had any. So we've been very blessed here, and we've been protected. And it's great to be together. So it's wonderful to have you here. Just a couple of things I just want to emphasize before we get started. Uh, just a quick reminder that we do want to be in compliance with our bylaws. And that means that it's really important. I know that we want to get out, we want to socialize, we want to hug, we want to do all the things that we uh, did in the past. That time is coming. I think it's coming very soon. But in the meantime, we do want to be a good witness and testimony to our neighbors, to those who are walking by, to, to everyone who might be listening in. I would just ask and just... Uh, ask you to please just remain in your cars. If you see someone across the way and you want to go and hug them, send them a text. We live in a pretty amazing day where we can do that. So I just want to just try and encourage you with that. Um, we have uh, uh, our uh, phone books, our phone directories are ready. We have uh, a number of versions available. If you have not received one, when you drive through later, uh, you can, of course, ask Jurgen or ask those when you bring your offering through as you're dismissed at the end of our meeting, and we'd be happy to give you one. If you'd rather have it in PDF form, you can email the office and we'll shoot you off an email with the list. I would just, again, remind you that this is personal information and should remain within the church family. Uh, there are a number of people who are outside the church family that may say, hey, I'd like to get a hold of Pastor Bobby. Don't give them my number. <laughs> They can get it through the office if they really need it. And that goes for everyone here. Not that I don't want to talk to people, but after 75 phone calls on my day off, you get the drift. So it's the same thing with you folks. We want to protect that personal information. So just be very wise with how you share that. Uh, again, uh, just as I mentioned, the dismissal at the end of our meeting, please, uh, please pay attention to the parking lot attendants. They are decked out in those jazzy outfits. You can see them a mile away. They reflect quite nicely. Ernie, I know Ernie loves his, and he's going to try and take his home to wear all the time. But please, we'd ask you not to drive up the middle. Please, as you're dismissed, we want to make sure that everyone is safe. Bumper cars is great at the carnival, not so much in our parking lot or for our insurance. So I would just ask you to please pay attention to our parking lot attendants as they dismiss you. This week, of course, we have our morning today. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m., there's praise and prayer in the fireside room. We have an elders meeting on Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., elders. Prayer meeting it continues on in our Bible study. Wednesdays at 6.30, and there's a men's fellowship and prayer time Saturday at 8 a.m. All of these events, all of these meetings, you must pre-register through the office. So please call Jurgen. And on the back of your bulletins is a list of uh, all the prayer requests and praise items, so please take some time to review that and go to the Lord in prayer. Today's key verse, 1 John 4, 15, uh, 14 to 15. 1 John 4, 14 to 15, it says, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God God abides in him, and he in God. 
Our loving Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Wonderful. Where are my Disciple Land families this morning? Can you wave to me so I can see you? Let's see you. Ah, I see those hands waving. Great. Well, welcome to church, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. You know what we did yesterday? It was such a beautiful day that we spent some time outside. Did you spend some time outside yesterday? Maybe going for a walk or riding your bike, something like that? Well, we did. We went down to our frog pond and spent an hour down there with our tadpole nets and a few other things and just had some fun down at the frog pond. And I was thinking about that. I, there were other families that came down there too. And there were kids with nets and there were grown-ups with nets. And the tadpoles are out in the frog pond. And this is the first year that I've seen tadpoles so early and so many. And not only tadpoles, there's little minnows, there's goldfish, there's frogs, and people were having a great time. And here's what I noticed. Any time somebody caught something in their net, do you know what they did? I caught something! They shouted it out loud. They were so excited. Everybody came running to see what did they catch. What was it? Was it a tadpole? Was it a fish? Was it a frog? It didn't matter if it was a grown-up or a kid who caught something. Everyone was equally excited, and everyone announced it so that we could all enjoy that something was caught. And I was thinking about that because in our story today that Pastor Bobby is going to be preaching about, it's the woman at the well again. And after she's talked to Jesus, do you know what she does? I know that you know what she does. She rushes back to the town, and she says, I met somebody. I think it's the Messiah, come and see. She was speaking from a place of joy and excitement and enthusiasm. And, you know, I likened it to catching a frog or a tadpole. But you know what? When we speak out of joy and excitement and enthusiasm, when something wonderful like that happens, we just want to share it. We want to share it with the people around. I am normally not a person that actually seeks out opportunities to talk, even though I know you see me a lot up here, that's not really my thing. I'd rather be sitting somewhere quiet with a book. But one time we were walking in the woods and you know what I saw? I saw an eagle. And it was the first time I'd ever seen an eagle in the wild. I've always only ever seen them at the zoo. And I saw the eagle and I was so excited and there was nobody around that the very first person I found happened to be the mail carrier walking on the street. And you know what? I stopped and I said, guess what? There's an eagle. I saw an eagle. Come and see. And I pulled the mail carrier. Well, I didn't pull her, but she came with me and saw where the eagle was and took out her phone and took a picture. It was out of the ordinary. I was excited and I wanted to share what I'd seen. Kids, I think that we can be just as excited about the Lord Jesus as we are about the cool things that we see outside or the cool things that we make and do that we just want to share with everybody. And I was thinking, how can we be that excited? Well, the woman at the well was that excited just after spending time talking with Jesus. So maybe we need to spend more time talking with Jesus, reading God's word, letting the Holy Spirit fill us up so that we're bubbling over with excitement about who Jesus is and what he is doing and what he's done in our own lives or in our family's lives. Kids, maybe ask mom or dad or grandma and grandpa to tell you a story about something that Jesus has done in their lives, in your family's life. I bet there's something that they would tell you, something exciting that would fill your heart up with a bubbling kind of joy and thankfulness to God for what he has done in your family's life and in your life. And then you can share it. Share it with somebody. Write a story about it. Draw a picture about it. Tell somebody about it. Let's share our excitement and our love for Jesus, just like we share when we catch a tadpole or a fish or a frog. Anyways, I hope you all have a great day today. I hope you're able to enjoy this beautiful weather. And I hope that you have an excitement for the Lord Jesus. Let's pray and ask him to fill our hearts up with that kind of joy, okay? Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for 
your goodness. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for this beautiful um, country that we live in. I thank you that we can enjoy being outside. I thank you that we can enjoy even being here together today. And I ask that you would, in a very special way, fill our hearts up so that we're bubbling over with joy for the Lord Jesus, that we want to share the love of Jesus with the people around us, that we're so excited we just can't keep it to ourselves, but that we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ, like the woman at the well. Help us to look forward to spending time with you. Help us to eagerly seek out time to read the Bible and spend time listening to your voice. And I just pray that you would bless the rest of our meeting here together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, have a great day. We'll talk to you next time. Everyone hear me okay? Good, excellent, excellent, thank you. Well, we're going to continue on in the book of John, and we've been enjoying this encounter that the Samaritan woman, by the well, has with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Angela mentioned, we're very quick to share things in our life, and some of them might be important things, I'm getting married, you might want to share that. Having a baby, okay. When you have your fifth one, nobody seems to care anymore. A hole in one, well, you'll, you'll plaster that everywhere you can. But sometimes we don't have that same excitement when we're talking about sharing Christ. The Samaritan woman's going to set a great example for us. As so much is happening in what seems to be a very casual conversation one midday afternoon, on the other side of the world 2,000 years ago. But there's so much more to unpack from this uh, everyday conversation. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn back to John's Gospel. And we're going to overlap a couple of verses from two weeks ago. Last week, of course, we took a break from Mother's Day. But we're in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said... What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields, for they're already white for harvest. And he who reaps wages or receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. When the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Our loving Father, creator of heaven and earth, Lord, we just thank you again for your word. We thank you that it is eternal, and that it shall stand forever, and it shall, as it goes out, not return void. I pray now that I would decrease and Christ be magnified. And may we be sensitive to the Spirit who ministers unto us the truths of Christ in your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, during a really low point in my life, I was uh, exposed to the gospel for, with clarity for the first time. You know, I, I had this sense of encountering the God of the Bible. Uh, there was an incredible 
uh, sense of love from those who shared it with me. I, I saw my, in my church family one of the greatest examples of self-sacrificial love. I saw what it was when Jesus said, the world will know you by your love, not only for Christ, but for one another. And as I experienced that, and it was continually exposed to the truth of God's word, I began to develop an understanding by the Holy Spirit, an understanding of the cross. And in that process, as the Spirit ministered unto me, he was the active agent in my being born again. I began to understand that the cross is not foolishness. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. There are people who will walk by this meeting today and consider the cross to be an absolute waste of time. That it is just one of many religions. To them it's foolishness. And yet we know that it is the wisdom and the power of God to save sinners like us. It is completely contrary to our way of thinking. And yet in those moments, in those first few pioneering steps of faith, as the Lord led me unto Christ, I understand that through the cross, through the shed blood of Jesus, and by confessing in him and believing in my heart that he died for my sins according to the scriptures, was buried and raised the third day according to the scriptures, by putting my faith and trust in him as it has been revealed to me in the word and in the lives of other believers who were ministering unto me, I began to recognize the power of God to wash away the sins of even the most vile sinners. And like so many believers, in those first few steps of faith, I was, as we would say, on fire for God. I was absolutely ablaze for Him. The newness of life. I had this voracious appetite for the Bible. I still do today. It's more of a, a technical hunger for it, but it, that's not to say it doesn't meet my spiritual needs. Of course it does. But I had this, this incredible desire to know every verse and every book and every chapter, everything about the authors and, and, and every little minute detail. I want to know everything about Jesus. I want to know everything about his life. I want to know what it was like to be a, a first century Orthodox Jew, what, that, what Jesus looked like as opposed to what we think he looks like today is this Caucasian, blonde hair, blue-eyed, you know, British actor in every movie, it seems, that walked around seemingly on air, but that he was the everyman, of course, without sin. I want to know everything about prayer. I want to know everything about God. I want to understand theology. I want to understand proper biblical doctrine. I want to understand the end times. I joined every Bible study in that first church I was a part of, I was part of a college and career group way back, a long time ago in my 20s. And got to know people, got to fellowship with people my age. I was in adult Sunday school. I was in two alternating Bible studies on Friday nights. One was, was geared toward more of the younger adults and new believers like myself. And there I met many friends, lifelong friends. One of them is, is still a friend today. And then the other one I was in was with mature believers men and women of a seasoned age, many of them retired pastors, Bible, retired Bible college professors. And there, as opposed to studying the gospel of John and, and, and really the basics of the faith, they were elbow deep into the book of Revelation, and I'm pretty sure my eyes fell out of my head as I was trying to understand all these concepts and bowls of wrath and trumpets and, and blood everywhere and, and I just... But it was amazing to sit under their teaching. Couldn't get enough of anything to do with the faith. Even thought about going to Bible college back then. Or, if you will, bridal college for many of us. But I had a desire to go to Providence in Manitoba. I couldn't stop myself from sharing with everybody I met who the Lord Jesus really was. What he had done in my life. What he was doing. What was coming. After all, eternal life, it says in the scriptures, everlasting life is something both we, we possess uh, one day, but, but we has, have as a current possession today. It says in 1 John 2 and 25 that this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. 
And that is something we have simultaneously today as a present possession. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. I wanted to share that with everybody I spoke to. And I did it in a very naive way. I couldn't control myself. I had this, this burning desire, this, 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 this burning need to witness to all those around me. I still do. But the, but the difference between Bobby of 20 years ago and the Bobby of today is that as I've matured or gotten old, according to my children, I've become a lot more dependent upon the, the, the Holy Spirit's ministry to discern the time, the place, the person. Using a much more discerning approach, I now witness in a way that speaks to the need of the individual in the same way that Jesus Christ spoke to the need of the Samaritan woman. And that's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's easy to go around hammering people with the Scriptures, hammering people with the Word of God, and doing it in a, in a condemning way. But we have to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as, as doves, and preach the truth in love. And in love, preach the truth. You know, we can, we can hammer people with biblical doctrine and the truth that they're lost, they're condemned, they're sinful, they're going to hell, and on the list goes. But when we do that, when we use maybe a more of a guilt-ridden approach, all we're doing is, is, is by dealing them the heavy hand of the gospel, all we're doing is we may be inadvertently inoculating them to the gospel. We may be pushing people away from Christ. And, they, and for, for some people, the, the, Jesus just simply because of a, a, a point of contention and resentment. And so we have to be very wise with how we share the gospel and depend on the Spirit of God. Because as we see here, there is a golden harvest. There is a great harvest of souls. But back in the first century, as, as Jesus would say in Matthew 9, the workers were few. We don't have that excuse today. We outnumber the original disciples at least six to one, maybe ten to one in this parking lot if you're a believer today. The workers today are not few. There are many workers today. The problem is, and I'm just as guilty of it, is that we've sort of put up our feet and say, Lord Jesus, come. And the Lord says, look up. Look up and see the work that's there for us. The work of witnessing and evangelism. I'm reminded constantly that there is a work to do, and we can't be procrastinators in preaching the gospel. I am a master. I could have a doctorate in procrastination. I've been taking this Bible college course and I've been given two extensions now. One of them was related to COVID, but the other one was just because I was too busy and I just, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And now I'm in my last week and I've got my exams. And have I studied enough, to be honest? Well, maybe not. Because I'm a master at procrastinating. And I'm sure many of you are. We're given a job to do, and I'll get to it tomorrow. Tomorrow becomes the next day, and that becomes the... We can't do that when it comes to preaching the gospel because we are in the last days, and we're running out of time. There are lost souls out there that need to be blessed by the beautiful feet that will go out there and preach the gospel to them, like Paul says in Romans. Paul urges us, today is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, but how will they know if they don't hear? They can only hear when we preach the good news. Today is the day to preach the good news. And that provides us with the additional blessing of a spiritual food. The disciples then, in this moment, had no idea. They had no idea what Jesus was talking about when he talks about spiritual food. There's a spiritual food that's provided to us, and we are blessed by it when we share the gospel. Because it pleases the Father... And it shows that we are walking in obedience to the Great Commission. That's what we'll see when Jesus talks about the food the disciples don't know about. The food of pleasing his Heavenly Father. The spiritual nourishment he received from submitting to God's plan, his Father's plan, and carrying out. But they'll come to know it. 
They'll come to know that eventually they will come to taste the spiritual food as all of them except the Apostle John would be martyred for being a witness and testifying to the faith. So first we begin with this incredible dramatic picture of witnessing. We've seen Jesus now cross cultural, social, religious boundaries to speak to this woman, to make the eternal offer of, of, of living water. And as soon as Jesus declares himself as the Messiah that the Jews and the Samaritans... Their half-breed cousins have been waiting for that, that he was the Messiah. Her heart, the Samaritan woman who had come to the well, who's avoided towns, has come at an awkward time of the day so that she doesn't have to, to meet the, 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 the sideways glances of the community around her because of her lifestyle. She comes and has this conversation with Jesus. And there, her, as he reveals to her that he's the Messiah, her heart begins to burn within her. She gets this sense of God's presence with this man. She gets this sense that he is the Messiah because of how he reveals to her in a very uh, caring way, as it were, but truthful that her life is full of sin. You've said, right, you don't have a husband. You've got five and so on and exposes her own, her own uh, sinful heart. And that reveals to her that, that she begins to understand this, this man is, is more than just a Jew. He's more than just a man. So many people today think Jesus was just, just this Jewish religious figure of the first century. He's more than that. When, when Nicodemus says, Rabbi, that, full, that, that title, though true, falls so woefully short of the glorious person of Jesus Christ. And though her knowledge is incomplete, she senses something different in this man. The way he spoke, the way he taught, the way he revealed himself as the Messiah through the power of his knowledge of, of the intimate details of her life, she comes to the conclusion that at, at the very least, this man is like the prophets of old. He's at least like a prophet of the Old Testament. He is at least like Moses in some way. And that, that he, he's a man who's close to God. That at least he is that. Her own sin, the way Jesus calls it out, to consider the emptiness of her life. All of that moves in her heart and is used by the Spirit of God. And she believed that this Jew that was sitting there, that was talking with her, asking for water, and then offers her living water, crossing, as I said, all those boundaries of the first century, he was the Messiah. He was the one they've been waiting for. And it's just at that moment, at that very precise moment when Jesus places himself as the Messiah, presents to her that he is the Messiah, that, that, that he's the one that they have been waiting for. That's when the, the disciples return. And there's no further conversation. That's the last of, that's, that ends the conversation. There's no pleading on Jesus' behalf to the Samaritan woman to remain. He doesn't say to her, let's continue to talk share with me your heart, and so on. The conversation was over. And as the disciples returned, she makes it, she, she runs into the very town that she have purposefully avoided to come to the well. Remember I said a couple of weeks ago that it seems like she came from another town and came to the well. Sometimes that's what we need to do when it comes to our conversations with people about Jesus. Just present him. In the way you talk, the way you live, in your family life, as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as a grandparent, just live that new life. Manifest the fruit of the Spirit, and as the Spirit gives you discernment, you share with people the emptiness of this life, and you present Christ. See, sometimes, and I was guilty of this in those, those early years, I pushed and I pushed and I pushed, and I wanted people to make a decision for selfish reasons, like some type of spiritual notch on my belt. Like, I got him saved. Nobody can get anybody saved. We can't even lead people to Christ properly. We are called to witness and to testify, and it's the Spirit's work to lead them to Christ. You can't lead them to water. I've, you know, you've heard it said, you can't lead a horse to water. I've also heard it said, but you can sour the oats. And that's what we have to do. We have to salt the oats of this world to show the emptiness, the fruitlessness of this life and allow the Spirit to, to, to bring them to the living water. That's all we can do. You can't, I can't save my children. 
I can't spiritually save them. I can only bring up them up in the truth of God's word, reveal to them the person of Christ in my behavior, in my prayer life, etc., etc., and all the disciplines of this Christian life. Share with them clearly the gospel. Share with them clearly, as, as with anyone, the, the, the absolute depravity of our hearts. Even the most good person has wicked thoughts. And that we are alienated from God, we're separated from God. But God has offered Christ as the atonement, as the reconciliation, as the payment for our sin. He is the avenue by which we can come into the presence of God through faith. And then it is to them and the work of the Spirit to convict them that they are then born again. All we have to do, present Christ. Don't push too hard. I do that sometimes. I still do. I push too hard. Yes, today is the day of salvation, but there today might be an hour from now. Joshua McDowell, who is a, a, a very popular Christian author, can't pinpoint an exact day that he was saved, but it was the ministry of people in his life over a period of time where he finally realized that he needed to be born again, that he needed to be saved, and he was. Sometimes that's what we need to do, just present Christ. Don't pressure people to the point. Yes, I know some of you are saying, well, the day is long. The night is coming. Yes. But the scriptures make it very clear that it is the Holy Spirit who has come into the world to convict it of its sin. Allow him to do his work and just be used by God to present the gospel. Jesus presents the example. This is the argument. He presented the offer of eternal life in the living water. He revealed that he is the Messiah, the Savior of God's people. And he left it there for her to do with what she will. And what does she do? As soon as the disciples return, the, the conversation is over. She takes off, runs into town. She leaves her water pot behind. And she displays that, that, that excited state of mind when we all first come to Christ. How much did she really know about Jesus? Well, we don't, we don't know explicitly from the text. But it was enough to move her to go into the town and ask the men, could this be the Christ? Based on the evidence, based on his knowledge of my life, Here's a man from, from, <clears throat> from Judea. He, he does not know my reputation, yet he's able to speak to it directly. Could this be the Christ? You know, she had a, it's a picture of her, hung, of her thirst for more than just the water that was in the well, the, the dead water, the stagnant water, which is illustrative of the, of the world today. She had a, 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 a thirst for true life, for spiritual satisfaction. She wanted to be freed from her former life. You know, she left her water pot behind, and I made mention of that a couple of weeks ago. You know, water pots, you know, you couldn't walk into a Home Depot and buy a water pot. They were very valuable pieces of, of equipment. It was a very practical household thing to have. It was, it was very useful if you needed to get water out of the well. The fact that she left it there at least implies she had the intention of returning but it was totally useless when it comes to that of living water. She couldn't get living water independent of Christ. Nothing in this life, all the water pots of this world and all the dead water of this world cannot secure for you eternal life. Definitely not a water pot. Can't secure you any. You, can't, you cannot have the sense of God's presence. You cannot have an understanding of his power, of the Holy Spirit, like you think of Simon the, the uh, Simon the sorcerer back in Acts, uh, I think it's around Acts chapter eight or so, where Peter and the, the apostles are performing these incredible miracles. And how do you do this? Can he offers them money? Give me money so that I can perform the miracles that you perform. You can't buy eternal life. You can't buy a victorious life by the Spirit of God. That comes by faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. The Word of God, hearing the Word of God. That's where we come into play. You can't earn it. There are so many people today who are religious, and they are some of the hardest people to penetrate with the truth of the gospel because they are so secure in their works, but they are never resting in their works. 
You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can only receive it as a gift. As a gift by God. And so with Jesus' display of all this intimate knowledge of her life, the promise of living water, all the significance, all the understanding of that, she takes off into town, tells people that they need to go see this man. They need to go hear what he has to say because, it, it, you know, could he be the Christ? As I said, how much did she really know? How much spiritual understanding did she have? Well, we can't really be sure, but, but she was moved by this encounter with Jesus of Nazareth. This Jew, this rabbi, this this man sitting by the well who said, please give me some water. She was moved so much that she, as I said, moved into this town that she would have been ashamed to do because of her lifestyle and runs into this town to share with them her encounter with Christ. How many of us are that excited today? To share with people our encounters with Christ. It's really the beginning. It's fascinating to see the beginning of global evangelism. This is the beginning of global evangelism. In some way, she's the first missionary. I'm using the term broadly here, but in a way, she's the, she's the, the beginning of global evangelism. Not the disciples. Yes, they've gone around and preached and so on, but she's a Samaritan woman. She's not a Jew. And Jesus plants the gospel in the heart of this Samaritan woman, this half-breed, these, these mongrels, according to the Jews. And she runs into town and begins to plant other seeds in the ears of other men to the point where they have to. They're, they're burning to come out to see this man. The seed of the gospel contained in the revelation of Jesus' messiahship, planted in the heart of a foreigner, We get to sit back, we get to enjoy this incredible harvest of souls. Now this takes us to Jesus' teaching on spiritual food. And the great harvest that comes from a faithful obedience to God's word and God's will. We are told at the end of the Gospels to go out into the world and to make disciples. And baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That requires evangelism. That requires testifying. That requires a witness. So while the Samaritan woman's in town, urging the men, you have to come out and see this man. You, he knew the most intimate details of my life. Something burned in my heart about him. The, the, the revelation of his messiahship. The way he spoke, the way he moved, the way he acted, the way he described living water. How he said he was the source of living water. That it would spring up into, it would bubble over in my own life. That my life would have purpose. It would have meaning. I would, I would have the dignity that, I, that has escaped in me my life. My entire life. Come and see him. While she's doing that, we see the disciples returning. They'd probably gone into town to get some food. It's lunchtime. And so they run to Timmy's. They grab a couple of uh, sandwiches and they make their way back to Jesus and they say, okay, Rabbi, it's time to eat. It's lunchtime. We've just had a long trip. It's sunny out. It's hot. You're talking to this woman. And they're probably scratching their heads. Why is, she, why is he talking to a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman? And he immediately addresses this, this concern that he needs to eat. You know, eat something, Jesus. Nothing wrong with eating. Jesus needed to eat. He had a body like all of us, except without sin, of course. I like to eat. Most of us here like to eat. So eat something. And he responds. And no doubt he needed to eat. He, he probably was hungry. We know he was thirsty. There's no record of the, of the Samaritan woman actually giving him a drink of water. The thought of a Jew drinking from a Samaritan's cup, that's just, that's just unheard of. So we know he's thirsty. We don't even know if he got the water. The water from, from the well. He's got to be hungry. Eat Jesus. But like so many times through Jesus' ministry, he takes what's common, something common, something that we experience in everyday life. Hunger, food, the need for satisfaction, the need for acceptance, the need for dignity, the need for purpose. He takes common illustrations, the, the common things of life, and he begins to, to use imagery to illustrate a spiritual truth. Was Jesus hungry? Many commentators say, yeah, he probably was hungry. But that's not the point. The point isn't that Jesus needed a sandwich. That's not the point. The point is he now takes this practical, 
physical truth, just as he did with the well and the dead water and the living water, he now is going to highlight a spiritual truth, that he has a food. It is a spiritual food that meets the longings, the spiritual uh, uh, hunger that he had, a food the disciples did not yet know of. They wanted Jesus to eat. Jesus wanted to see souls saved. He wanted to see the seed of the gospel planted in the heart of this woman. He wanted to witness the great harvest of souls that would come over the mountain toward them. His food wasn't something the disciples could provide for him. His food in this moment, his food in this moment, as that woman is is testifying in town about her encounter with Jesus, was the continuing need to evangelize according to the Father's will. Jesus' food was the food of pleasing his Father. Jesus' food was leading people to the living water. Jesus' food was bringing people to God through him. Jesus' food was revealing the nature of God in him. His food was being faithful to God and obedient every step of his life. His food was seeking and saving the lost. Even the hated Samaritans, there was no greater work, no greater satisfaction than to fulfill the Father's will for his life and do his work. Jesus was spiritually satisfied in this moment because he had shared the good news with the Samaritan woman. How many of us have experienced that type of satisfaction? My wife makes the best homemade lasagna. Bobby, what do you want me to make this? What do you want me to make this? Lasagna. Well, what about tomorrow? Lasagna. And what about the third day? Well, you know what? Let's be crazy. Let's go have a triple header of lasagna. And when I eat that, she can see in my face. First of all, after she's like, that's disgusting. Because I'm just shoveling it in. But she sees the satisfaction it gives me because I know she's labored and loved over it. And now she's passed it on to Emma. And Emma works on it. And she makes the meals. And, and, uh, and I just, I, I just there's a, there's a, she says I have a look on my face when I eat certain foods. It's this look of euphoria. Apple, uh, pardon me, strawberry rhubarb pie. I'm sorry, some of you I can tell are getting hungry. But there's, she says I get this look. Bliss, satisfaction as I'm eating these things. Do we have the same type of look, bliss, satisfaction, when we share the gospel? We should. Because it meets that spiritual hunger in us to evangelize, to be in the obedience of God's will, to go out by his spirit and seek and save the lost. Not that we can save them, but we can go out and share with them the good news of Christ that we can see someone delivered from the demons of their own life, delivered from the bondage of sin, snatched from the hands of the enemy, and now we will see them in glory. What is my hope, my joy of crown of rejoicing? Is it not you, Paul says, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? He says that to the Thessalonians, I believe. A joy in knowing that someone has been born again and will join all of their brothers and sisters in heaven one day. That should give us the greatest satisfaction, the greatest joy in this world. He was satisfied. Jesus was satisfied because he had shared the good news with the Samaritan woman. And they were about to to see the the fruit of Jesus' efforts, of his work. He lived to please his Father. And by doing his will, and living obedience to him, completing it from sowing the seed in the heart of this woman, to the impending harvest that was about to make their way out to them. All of that spiritually satisfied Christ. Unlike anything in this world ever can. And that should be the heart of all of his disciples. All of us here who are disciples of Jesus should long after that spiritual satisfaction. Will there be moments where we share the gospel and it is rejected? Yes! Yes! But it is still the heart that he is long-suffering, the heart of God that he is long-suffering, that all should be, should be saved. I'm not going to get into the why one brother believes and one brother doesn't. 
why one sister in the family believes and one doesn't. I'm not going to get into that debate right now. We are called to share. And in sharing, we shall have a spiritual food that will sustain us in this life. We have to, in our lives, place a higher priority on a need of obedience to God, especially when it comes to the Great Commission, especially when it comes to making disciples. Jesus, as he's evangelizing, he is simultaneously discipling the apostles to prepare them for that spiritual food that they will taste, that they will partake of, because they are going to be the generation to go out and begin to spread the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So he's evangelizing and simultaneously discipling. And that should be the heart of, in our, that should be in our lives. We need to place a higher priority on evangelism. Especially now that borders are closed. Our missionaries are primarily their home. Well, now we see that it's time to evangelize here at home. It's time to evangelize this part of, of the Father's vineyard. We've all got some, some grapes to tend. And it's time to roll up our sleeves and get to work. All of us, collectively. We have to put a higher priority on looking up and seeing the fields of this earth. A higher priority to, to take on that challenge that Jesus lays out for us. Look up. Basically, Jesus is saying, stop looking down at the earth. Stop being so preoccupied with your own life. Because it lasts about that long. And eternity goes on forever. So stop focusing so much. Stop putting so much, too much emphasis on it. We can't be so heavenly minded that there were no earthly good. But at the same time, there has to be a balance there. Look up, Jesus says. And look at the fields. Look at the people walking by. Look at the people driving past our building. And meaning that, that need to go out evangelize will be satisfied. Look up. Look, look and see all the people streaming all around the world who need to hear the gospel. You know, when Jesus said this, the disciples would have seen probably this, this dramatic scene of the Samaritans. As the Samaritan woman is sharing her, her encounter with Christ, they would have seen the, the Samaritans coming over the fields in hundreds. Some Bible commentators even believe possibly even the thousands at the potential of, of the Messiah's arrival. In Jesus' heart, his arms, he reaches out in compassion. He reminds us in Matthew chapter 9 where, where all the, oh, such, it's really heartbreak. Because it still takes place today. Look around. And see all the people who are helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Wandering. Blind. Lame. Spiritually lame. Spiritually impotent. Like the man by the pool at Bethesda. And Jesus looks out in compassion on that crowd in Matthew 9 and says, Look. They're like sheep without a shepherd. That hasn't changed. 2,000 years later, that hasn't changed. Look around. They're like sheep without a shepherd. We have a shepherd. Now we need to go tell others about him. Look at all those souls. Look, look at all of them who need compassion and love and the truth, the rock of truth upon which all of that is built. My heart breaks at the state of our children today and the state of families and the confusion that is running rampant in mainstream media that is now, de it's demanding to be accepted even by those who hold to the truth of Scripture. They need the gospel. How desperately they need the gospel. They need the living water that only Jesus can offer. Look at all the souls. Look at, look at everyone who is so arrogantly self-sufficient. I used to be arrogantly self-sufficient. Secure in their own ignorance. I thought I was a good guy. Somehow I could outweigh the cosmic balance of good and evil and inherit eternal life, whatever that looks like. Look at all those who consider their own wisdom to be the greatest of all wisdom. Their own efforts at being religious. But they need the gospel. Jesus knew this woman and the Samaritans. 
needed the gospel. That's why he said, I got to go through Samaria. I've got a divine appointment. I'm going to go plant that seed of the gospel in that Samaritan woman. And while I'm discipling you, watch. Look up and look at the fields. Look at the harvest that comes to you. You didn't even, he says to the disciples, you didn't work for this harvest. There's a sower and a reaper. Jesus sowed. The disciples are about to reap. There's a thirst in so many. So many. A thirst for more than this life can offer anybody. There's loneliness everywhere. There's emptiness in so many. A sense of, of lives without purpose, without meaning. There's so many who, who are just, they're lost. And they try to, to uh, dress up their lives as being significant. But when they're alone, when they're alone and honest, you realize their lives are empty. And God's people, all of us here who are a part of God's family, we're right in the middle of the field. So look up. Bobby, look up. Look up. Get our eyes off the things of this world. You know, Jesus uses that, that, that measurement of time between the sowing and the reaping of the fields. It's about four months, no matter where you live in the world. Except, of course, don't get smart, the North or South Pole. The only thing you're planting there are ice cubes. But it's approximately four months to plant and to harvest. But here, from Jesus' perspective, the spiritual harvest had already begun. The seed was planted, and it was planted in the good soil, in the heart of this woman, and it begins to spread. And she tells one, he tells another, and he tells another. And it was a ripe time for a harvest of souls as they all the Samaritans come out of town to see this Jesus of Nazareth, this man who claims to be the Messiah. The word had been sown by Jesus into the heart of this one Samaritan woman. Now is time to reap. And Jesus calls the disciples to a harvest that they had not participated in sowing. In Jesus' first use of parables, one of his first use of parables, he talks about the, the farmer and sowing on the different types of soil and the results thereof. Some don't grow. I mentioned that already. You're going to share the gospel. The seed is planted. Nothing grows. And Jesus gives a description of that. Hard soil, soft soil, thorns, thorns and choke out the growth. Some, don't grow, some grow but don't develop any roots. They die away. Some are choked out, but some grow. So spread the seed far and wide. Because they're the ones, those are the ones that grow, that are sown on the good ground. It grows into a great harvest. And when the farmer sees that the grain is ripened, it says in Mark 4 and 20, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The harvest has now come. Jesus is calling on the disciples to join him and harvest the fields they did not plant. Put out the sickle because the grain is ripe. Some of us will plant. Some of us will water. God gives the increase. So we're called to sow. We're called to harvest. God's the one who gives the increase. Even though the Samaritans hadn't gotten to the well yet, he knew their hearts. Jesus knew the hearts of those who were coming out to them. And Jesus calls on the disciples to join him and harvest the field. Put out the sickle. The grain is ripe. It's golden and ready to be taken in. He knew their hearts. And our joy as disciples, as we close out here, our joy as his disciples today, 2,000 years later, removed from this conversation, is that we get to enter in with our brothers and with our sisters into this work. And that's the, the wages we receive. The wages we receive is the joy of gathering fruit for eternity. We don't always see the harvest. We don't always see the harvest of the, of the seed we sow. Jesus did here. The disciples did here. But sometimes we're called to sow the seed, and as I said, already others water. God gives the increase. In the case of the Samaritans, Moses had sowed the seed. They had the Pentateuch. They had the law. 
John the Baptist, in his proximity to where he was baptizing, no doubt word got to the Samaritans. There's some crazy man who eats locusts and has, has a very uh, a trendy outfit out in the wilderness who's baptizing a baptism of repentance and preparation for the Messiah. So John the Baptist is sowing the seed. Jesus here sows the seed directly by revealing his Messiahship. And even though the disciples, as I, I already said this, they didn't sow the seed. They were in town. They were at the local McDonald's drive through grabbing their Big Macs and making their way back to Jesus. They weren't part of sowing the seed directly. Jesus was. But the, even though they had no part in sowing the seed, Jesus sends them out to reap that which they did not sow. And so we all have a part to play in sowing and reaping. It's the greatest work imaginable because... It endures. I love what I do. Is pastoring hard? Just ask Pastor Dave. You'll never hear him say, and I didn't consult him with this, but I know he would never say, yeah, it was the easiest thing I've ever done. It's hard. But I love doing it. But what I enjoy more is entering into the labor of sowing seed. You know, I watched Laura come out and illegally feed our chickens. Don't tell anyone. We've got a couple of fowly friends in the backyard. And she goes out and she throws out. Now it's food. It's not necessarily seed, but she throws it out there. And they all do their thing and cluck, 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 and pick, 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 and do their thing. But it's, it's, it's fun to watch you just kind of toss it out. That's what we have to do with the gospel. Just sow the seed. Send it out far and wide. That's the greatest work any of us can do. There's no greater joy than serving and laboring with others for the kingdom of heaven. What greater privilege than to have a part? God, God uses us in the unfolding work of his salvation. What greater work is there? Some people love their jobs. That's wonderful. But the greatest work is the work that we do for the kingdom of God because it has eternal significance. What greater honor than to be chosen by the Lord to serve alongside and to share the gospel? What greater blessing to our soul than to see the results of those labors? Even after our life, we may not see the results, but in glory, we will be witnesses of them. We'll see God's faithfulness. To see those who were once lost come to know through the work of the Holy Spirit, to know Jesus as their Savior, verse 42, that he's the Savior of the world. But individually to, to see a person come to Christ, to see, as it were, like Paul, the scales come off their eyes, and to see the truth of who Jesus is, that he's not just the Messiah. He's not just a guy sitting by the well. He's not someone who, who teaches in parables and is a religious leader and loves the children and so on and so forth, but that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world, the Savior of his people. There's no greater joy than to see that spiritual light bulb come on in the mind and the heart of a lost person. To see them go from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. To no longer refer to them as the lost, but as the believer, as a redeemed soul. And that he's not just a savior. Not just the savior of the Jews, but the savior of a whole world that believes on him. To see a spiritually dead person brought to life. We're called. We're called to sow the seed. Keep our eyes up. Be actively participating in evangelism, in witnessing, living a holy life as God is holy, and watch God go to work. I'm going to close in prayer, and there's a little song I'd like to play for you as you begin to slowly make your way out, as the deacons dismiss you, please, please, as they dismiss you, please listen closely to this wonderful song as we close in prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you again for this wonderful time by the well with Jesus. We just thank you again for the burden of reaching the lost. Father, help us to sow the seed far and wide in the hearts of so many. And we pray that your spirit would work a great work that people would come to see their desperate need, their spiritual bankruptcy, and come to Christ. Father, help us to keep our eyes up and to see the great harvest of souls 
Father, we pray that you would put us to work for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Truly then it multiplies